because the next one, uh, we are talking a little bit about the future of privacy. And one of the things that we've um, previously spoke of is this notion of privacy is changing, right? Like we went from like cookie tracking with your ID and your like email address attached, your personal identifiable to session IDs today, like many systems like Mixpanel are just the recording of the session. So the getting data is just not personally as personally identifiable, although that's kind of questionable because you may be able to connect the two. And then there's the next step, which is like block, you know, like uh, AI, you know, you're training some model. And then as we keep going on these different steps, it feels like you, because it's less connected to you, your rights to that data become lower, right? And your ability to correct that data, especially if it's like an AI and we like, um, we both talked about coded bias and how like AI has these built in biases. So your ability to say, no, this is like the wrong model. Like you're not like, this is not an accurate representation of me uh, becomes less and less. Cause it's like, it's not you, <laughs> it's some AI model. And I'm curious about like, where do you see like, like what, what's happening with AI and how does that relate to privacy? Well, you know, what's happening with AI, you know, there are all these AI advancements that are coming out and it's being pushed out, but uh, there are so many harms that can happen to people that aren't really being addressed uh, in AI. And it's highly problematic, um, especially in education, in my opinion. Uh, so, can you give some examples? Sure, absolutely. So um, there was, there, there, because of the pandemic, a lot of kids are working from home. And uh, some of these uh, uh, systems that some educators have put in place had kind of emotion tracking. So like they would try to, uh, to determine the emotional state of the child when they were doing work. And so as a result of that, the algorithm would do things like give people, let, let, let's say Sally was not doing well at math, instead of the teacher saying, okay, Sally needs more help in math, the algorithm will, will say, well, let's give Sally less rigorous things to do. Okay. So then they're putting her on a different path. So maybe they'll say, let's show Sally how to bake cakes. Okay. So she's not good at math or something like that. So there are all these patterns that are being created in AI that can put kids on paths that are, are detrimental in the future. You know, who's to say that down the line that Sally isn't gonna get into these higher classes, she's gonna be closed out from different things just because of, you know, an algorithm that said that she was unhappy when she was doing math or something. And that's a huge problem. Um, so to me, this is this is fascinating because um, in education nowadays, it seems like there's these, this fork in the road and it seems like we're either going to move really heavy into this AI proctoring world where everything is like managed like by AI, kind of like freelancing work is kind of determined by an AI. Like how good are you is really dependent on what the algorithm thinks, not what people think. And then uh, in the same way, like education could be headed in very much the same way. Uh, and then the other is like, we either do that or we move towards creativity. And I don't know, like, it seems like the, the, the books are stacked towards the proctoring side at this time. And I'm curious, okay, so if it set you into the wrong direction, like it kind of made some assessment and this has happened. I remember for hearing in Coded Bias, they talked about like teachers being evaluated and they said right. like, this teacher is not a good teacher um, because the algorithm said so, right? Even though the teacher may be a, actually a very good teacher, but it was just because they work with students in a very low socioeconomic status environment that, you know, things went like, th of course, the grades are going to be lower, they're going to score worse. And if, if that's what your AI is looking at, it's just like scores, for example, uh, then you're going to, yeah, things are going to be a problem. And so it, it kind of makes me wonder, like, okay, so we are aware of these types of biases. Um, what can we do? Like, well, how do we how do we fight back on on these things? Is it legal recourse? Like, what what do, like what are you gonna do? Like, sue sue the companies? Like, I don't know. <laughs> well, people are suing those companies, and I think what has to happen is that there has to be 
a way to bring more transparency into how these algorithms are working and what judgments are being made. And then, you know, the humans also can't abdicate their responsibility. So in the example that you gave about the teachers and the code is coded bias, you know, uh, the example they gave was about this teacher had one teacher of the year, you know, year after year, but then this algorithm told him that, you know, he's a bad teacher and they fired him. You know, that to me, that's where a human should step in and say, wait a minute, this is not right. As opposed to saying, well, the algorithm said this and we're going to, you know, fire this teacher, which is problematic. You know, I think I try to, you know, I think that people are trying to make AI seem like it's a teddy bear and it's actually a grizzly bear. So <laughs> we need to look at it a lot differently because there can be unintended harms. You know, it, it, it's not as though the people who are making these apps are trying to harm people, but they're not looking at the harms in the way that it should be. So I give you another example. So think about blood transfusion, right? Mm -hmm. So the way blood transfusion works now, you if, if you were to get one, they would figure out what your blood type was, right? Before they gave you blood or that would kill you. So now the way AI is being rolled out now, it's like, okay, we tested on our friends and they're this blood type and it works. And then now we're going to throw it on everybody and it's supposed to work. It's very dangerous to think of it in that way. So we have to be able to pull it back, um, pull back the curtain, make it more uh, visible and have people who can audit and people who are best uh, suited to be able to look at these things. You know, if I if my blood type is different, okay, I can say, wait a minute, you know, this works on you because you're the person who tested it, but now you're trying to make the leap and try to force it on everyone else. It may not work that way. Absolutely. Like, th this is the concern I have is that more and more like humans are deferring decisions um, to our artificial intelligence. And I've always described like uh, AI as not so much a intelligence, but more like an unconsciousness, which just makes automatic decisions, not necessarily good ones, but it just makes them and it makes them fast. And, and that's why we end up with so many negative consequences. Like, oh, you're not a good teacher, even though like it's just it, it can't handle the exception is basically what it's saying. Or right. in this case, the blood transfusion, it just doesn't know it, it lacks some context. Uh, or like a court decision or a, a health decision, like all of these decisions are being made and they have very real like long-term life consequences and that critical thinking for the computer isn't there. It's just looking for people who are like you. Oh, most people like your, like, like this individual, um, they don't go for more treatment, maybe because they live in lower socioeconomic status environments. So we're just going to recommend less treatment for you. You don't, you don't need it. And I think that the big challenge that I see in this space is um, anxiety, right? Like anybody who's used AI proctoring, where it's just like scanning the environment, they, they describe like a feeling of like, they're already really anxious because of the pandemic and being locked down. But then you add in, by the way, like while you're taking this test, there's, you have to install this software. And this software is going to basically like, be the equivalent of spyware on your computer. It's going to monitor everything, every keystroke, you know, your web camera, your, your microphones. Like you think like, you know, Facebook is creepy. Just wait until you try this stuff. And it was like, that's the kind of environment that a lot of people are moving to. And they're like, how is this good? <laughs> right. How is this going to be result in something that's going to help our children succeed? I mean, I can see it's good for uh, an administrator who wants like, oh yeah, everything's, I, I'm trying to figure out how to do tests online and keep it consistent. Um, I can get that. But I think that the challenge is like you miss the human element. And it's like, uh, like there's certain things that AI is never really going to be great at. Those like creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, communication skills. Yeah. And I was hoping like maybe you could speak a little bit to, okay, let's think like if we, if we threw the clock even further back, right? Like you, you asked me a question which I thought was really prescient. And it made me think a lot was if you had a magic wand, for example, and you could change things or you had one thing that you could kind of control for the long term future uh, that you think would be most beneficial for, for people, 
um, what do you think that would be, at least from a privacy like world? What would your, what would be the first command of your, your uh, privacy magic wand? Oh, you turned the magic wand question on me. Very <laughs> good, very good. Yo, uh, you started it. I love it. <laughs> for me, it's about privacy being a human right everywhere, where it's not right now. So. Privacy is not a fundamental human right in the U.S. and other countries is not. Um, so the thing that happens in the U.S. is that a lot of privacy and a lot of a lot of privacy regulation and enforcement happens a lot on the state level as opposed to the federal level. So we do have privacy. We do have laws that address privacy on a federal level only by sectors. But there are a lot of gaps there if you're thinking about um yeah. consumer versus human rights to privacy. So not every human is a consumer. So a lot of the U.S. laws especially are uh, pointed towards consumer. So if you so think about this in terms of economics, if you don't have money to consume, then what privacy rights do you have if those rights are not human? So the example I gave is, let's say you take a picture of you and your grandma, you're on Facebook. You post a picture on Facebook. She decides she doesn't like the fact her picture's on Facebook. She cannot go to Facebook on her own and say, hey, I don't like this picture because she's not a consumer of Facebook. So you could only, you would be the only person to be able to do that. So if she, want, if she wants to take action, or she wanted Facebook to take action uh, about her photo, she would have to become a consumer of Facebook. She would literally have to create an account and say, hey, I don't like this picture. You know what I'm saying? So if you're not a uh, consumer, a lot of these rights don't apply to you. And that's why I think it's a huge problem. So in this case, you're referring to the instance of things like shadow profiles or maybe like a photo that a friend posted of you, but you don't actually have an account on there. Like because you don't have an account, you literally have no rights to to this because your you're like rights only extend to the user. And like right. to me, like oh, I I love what you're saying so much. And one of the reasons for that is, um, the the privacy and human rights thing. Like it they they, they seem separate like they seem like oh it's like not a big deal like we give up our privacy what's the the big deal but it feels like in the world of ai like that's it that's all you got right like ai the only thing that an ai is hungry for is data right and like the only way to do anything to fight back against a ai is literally to starve it of that data and if you don't have rights to that data and it feels like increasingly we have less rights to them um, as opposed to more rights, because we, we try to make them slightly more anonymous, but they're still like, and, and we think of like data as like, oh, it's just the, like these photos that we share, but like we talked about before, it's like, no, like you're uploading your like unconscious beliefs, your like unconscious values into that system. We just don't realize that we're, we're doing it. Um, it feels like, you know, this, this data is a gold mine, right? It's, it's like, it's literally like everything that you potentially want to buy in the future. It's every, like, it's, it's literally everything that you, um, you believe really strongly and that would potentially influence how you would vote, how you would, you know, purchase. Like a lot of your key career decisions could be determined by, by what we show you in terms of the, the ads on this. So it's a really, really important decision and you have no rights to it. No. And so what does it right. mean if we if we don't have rights to to this um like if we if if our ideal doesn't happen um then what's the consequence of that? Like so if we kind of like today um it, it like it's interesting because it feels like the rules apply differently. Like if you were the CEO of uh Facebook and you didn't like something, that thing would be taken down. Totally. Right? Like there would be no questions asked. Right. Now, if you're Joe Blow, right, or somebody like myself, and you're like, right. I don't like this, you know, what's on there, they'll, they'd like fight hard to say like, oh, well, you know, we're trying to protect freedom of speech. And, you know, we, we can't like have you take down stuff that you don't like uh, and you don't consent to. Like, well, that would be like a violation of freedom of speech. So like, how come like the rules apply differently? So what would we do? What could we do? 
what would happen if we lived in that? Like, I guess it's what happens if things stay the same? Yeah, it's problematic uh, because the data collection is only going to get more intense. You know, we're always inviting new technologies into our house or we're using new stuff. Um, you know, there's going to be, especially with 5G um, computing, it's going to be a computing on steroids at that point uh, where things are going to be done that we weren't able to do before. Um, a lot of this is going to lead into things like virtual reality, augmented reality, um, especially in education and medical. Those are two big areas uh, that are seeing that. So as as the future comes, uh, comes forward, we're going to have to share even more data, uh, more data about our location, more data about sort of what we do. And some of these some of these applications have to have that. So let's say if you wore uh, virtual reality glasses or goggles, you look like my glasses, you can walk down the street uh, in order to make sure you, you didn't possibly walk into the street, like look for a Pokemon or something like that. Uh, they would need to know your exact location, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. you're going to be giving over more data. Um, and then I think it's important that people be, you know, be an educated consumer. So, you know, is the is the benefit worth the trade off? You know, did you give for your privacy? So, like, I give you an example. So, talk about air tags. So, air tags oh, is it. a new thing that Apple put out. Um, so yeah. it's about to find your keys or whatever. But it really is not to find your keys, it's to find you. So it's a way to get your exact location of where you are. And that's going to be something that's going to be very beneficial in the future for new like games or new things that people are putting out that have to do with your location. Yeah, exactly. Like to me, I've, I've seen so many, like I've been tracking that um, closely because on one side, We've got Apple saying like, hey, we're protecting your privacy. Look at like in iOS like uh, 14, we've got this um, ask the app not to track. But it's not that they're not tracking you. It's just that Apple's tracking you instead of, you know, uh, instead of Facebook. It's like, yeah, you know what? Nothing's really changed. We just want to move more people to our own advertising system. We should get a big piece of that pie. Yeah. Uh, and then when, it, when you look at AirTags and how incredible it is because it has no location doesn't have a gps on it but so many people have iphones that like you literally could drive down the street and it will know where you are just based on that information and so people so many people have like mailed an air tag you know to a, yeah. a different country or different location and then boom like every every step along the way oh where was it that whole time it's like if you wanted to like tracking a person wouldn't be hard you know, using that, you like stick it to the back of their car. They don't have to consent. You would know exactly where they are. Yeah. Well, they said that they made a, they have something in there that would tell you if someone's trying to track you using air tag. So someone put a tag on you or whatever. It will let you know if you had an iPhone. I guess you, if you didn't have an iPhone, this wouldn't work, right? Uh, but if you had an iPhone and someone tried to put a tag on you, they said there's something in there that would let you know that something is tracking you, like maybe something in your purse or in your car or whatever. But, you know, it, this goes back to consent again. So you can consent to be tracked by other people if you want to. Um, and then, you know, again, these things, you know, th think about the, the contact tracing apps they're putting together for different countries and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, those things, you know, we're using Bluetooth to try to get your proximity to another person. And it's not always exact, right? Because, you know, you may not have your Bluetooth on, uh, you know, there are a lot of variables in there that make it not as precise as they want it. So an AirTag will make it very precise. They will know exactly where you are in, in uh, juxtaposition to where this AirTag would be. So that's what they need. So a lot of you're going to probably see a lot of things that will do like let's say they want you to have a watch and a phone a phone and air tag so you know so it has to be two things that they can mm -hmm. use to actually find your location 
Yeah, there are many different ways location can be used. So probably the most popular one is, you know, in order for you to get sales service from a mobile phone, they need to know where your phone is, right? So there's that. So that that's an, a purpose that we've all accepted because we all use mobile phones. We should, right? Uh, there is a, the marketing part of location tracking where, let's say, you go near a store and they'll send you a coupon or something or, you know, they 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 want to know, like, uh, let's say they sent you a email or, or you clicked on an ad or something. They may want to track you to see if you actually went in the store and made a purchase. Like, that's one thing they want to do. So, you know, that's kind of creepy as well. Uh, uh People may not know or understand that type of tracking. Uh, there are problematic tracking things that happen where, you know, just like we were talking about this AirTag thing, um, you know, just having your phone on and having had communications with certain people, they can, they may be able to track your location. Uh, and, and a lot of apps ask for it. So I don't know if you can notice this on your phone. We're like, oh, can we track your location? while you're using the app or all the time. It's like, why would I want you to track me all the time? That makes no sense. You know what I'm saying? Like there are certain apps. It's like, why would you need that information? You know, I'm curious what they're using it with. So I think location is very important. Location is very important in the future because of all these new things they're going to be using lo location data for, uh, mm -hmm. for these new applications. But then the flip side of that is that some people can use, for example, let's say, you know, companies, big companies like Apple and Google are trying to do things where they're trying to cut off or give less data to third party companies, right? Mm -hmm. The tracking. But those third party companies can do things like fingerprinting, where they can take a lot of tangential data about you and then figure out who you are just from that without you telling oh, who you are. And the part of that is location. So let's say your your location is at a certain place uh, between midnight and 6 a.m. in the morning. So they can infer that you live there, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, it's not that hard probably for them to figure all this stuff out, you know. So let's say John, you know, so I'll give an example. So let's say, let's say right now, the way the tracking is, you know, uh, you can, uh, a marketer can get your phone and they know exactly who you are. So you're John who lives on Main Street in Cincinnati, you drink beer, you drive a pickup truck, you have two kids, okay? So maybe the anonymization that the company does is they, they tell the marketer, okay, somebody lives on Main Street in Cincinnati and drinks beer and drives a pickup truck. But they pretty much, it's not hard for them to figure out that it's John. <laughs> That's right. Like th this is what I was saying, like session ID is like so easy to get back to the same person. Like you have so many things in common with other people. Fingerprinting a person is like trivial yeah. for the most part. And I think uh, Alice's question also relates to um, the other component about, like we talked about consent. Now mm -hmm. we consent to tracking um, but we often have no transparency to, as to what they are actually doing with said data. Like the, the general assumption is we'll do whatever we want with this data. Right. And I think that that's the real challenge is that we can't ask these companies, what do you want our location for? Why are you using this data? Uh, because we just consent on broad to, to the, the use of tracking and any type of analytics with it. And it's like, are we ever going to get to a point where we'll start to have some transparency on that's great. You're tracking this information. What are you going to do? Why do you need to track this information? Right. I think we're getting there. A lot of the regulations that are coming out now are very much tying data tracking or data collection to purpose. So where in the past it was like, let's collect as much as we can. And then we figure out later what we want to do with it. Now they're saying even before you collect the data, you have to have a purpose. So I'm hoping as a result of that, there'll be more transparency into what companies are doing, but really, mm. really what they want you to do is consent so then they can do whatever they want with it. So, and the problem is the transparency again. So it's not evident to you as a consumer 
what all they're going to do with the data. They just want you to consent to whatever it is they want to do with the data. And I think in the future, what's going to happen is less people. So people are going to share more data with less companies. That's what's going to happen in the future. And these other companies that are going to be left out. They're going to start to try to give financial incentives to people to share. So they'll say, oh, you know, let me give you this coupon or let me give you this, you know, whatever, uh, so that you can give me more information about you. So I think that's where we're going in the future.